Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this event on recovery while fostering sustainability and resilience, financial sector development in the age of COVID-19. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you, and uh, I promise you a very interesting and lively debate over the next 90 minutes. Um, uh, so uh, this webinar is part of the uh, of a uh, event series organized by uh, the SOAR Center uh, for Sustainable Finance, where I am located, uh, the uh, East 3G Think Tank, uh, CSEN, and the Bennett Institute for Public Policy. And uh, we are looking at um, the effects of the crisis and how to respond to the crisis in a sustainable way. And uh, today we will be looking at uh, financial sector development and um, actually, sorry, I forgot to introduce myself. Uh, I am Uli Vold, I'm the director of the SOAS Centre for Sustainable Finance at SOAS University of London. And um, so I think the topic uh, we are discussing today is a very uh, pressing one. Um, the COVID crisis has caused uh, huge trouble around the world, but the impacts have been uh, the worst, arguably, in uh, developing countries. And uh, the figures we are seeing from uh, the World Bank and others show that um, there are already big impacts on uh, poverty, uh, growth progress that has been achieved over the past uh, decades has partly been wiped out. And so there is a real danger that the development successes we've seen uh, will be uh, reversed and not only short term. And uh, so uh, we do need to think about how to um, help countries to, to uh, grow back. Um, everyone's talking about, uh, about uh, green recoveries and so on, uh, but we do need uh, also to make sure that there is sufficient finance to do that. And uh, so uh, there is an important role for the financial sector, uh, also in stabilizing the situation. Uh, but there's arguably also a very important role for uh, public development banks. Uh, and uh, so this is a background against which we want to discuss today um, a number of questions relating to financial sector development uh, and uh, also consider what are the lessons that we may uh, draw from the present crisis and of course also previous crises um, and in how to shape um, how to shape uh, uh, future policies. Uh, and I'm uh, most delighted that we have uh, an excellent cast speaker uh, with us today. Um, we will first have a, a keynote speech by uh, Rémi Rioux, uh, who's the uh, CEO of uh, Agence Française de Développement. Um, we will then also have uh, Shamshad Akhtar, who's chair of the board of directors of Karandas Pakistan. Uh, and uh, former um, uh, governor of the Central Bank of Pakistan, uh, also former finance minister, and she's also uh, had many uh, senior positions in the UN and at the World Bank. Uh, we will also have Stephanie Griffiths-Jones, the Financial Markets Program Director uh, at the Initiative for Policy Dialogue at Columbia University. Um, uh, Marianne Haag, who's the Executive Director uh, of the Green Digital Finance Alliance, uh, Sony Kapoor, who is Managing Director of the Nordic Institute for Finance, Technology and Sustainability. And um, also known in uh, his uh, capacity as Chairman of uh, Redefine. Um, but uh, before I invite uh, the other speakers to, to uh, jump in, I, it's my great honor to, to ask Remy uh, to give a keynote. And so Remy is not only uh, the CEO of uh, IFD, uh, he is also the chairman of the International Development uh, Finance Club. And uh, also very importantly, um, uh, he will be chairing in November uh, from 9th to 12th uh, November, uh, the Finance in Common Summit in, well, Paris or kind of virtual Paris um, I, for one, would love to go to Paris right now, but, um, well, next year, hopefully. 
Um, and so this, this, is a, this will be a very important summit. It is the first global summit of all public development. And uh, so uh, it will be a place where a lot of important issues around development finance will be discussed. And uh, so it's, it's really great that we can have uh, in the run up to that, this discussion. Uh, and I hope there will be some good ideas coming out of this that uh, Remy can then uh, take forward. Uh, without further ado, I would like to uh, invite Remy to deliver his keynote speech. And I'm very, very much looking forward to this. Thank you for uh, being with us. And uh, uh, despite your super busy schedule, Remy, the floor is yours. Oh, thanks a lot, uh, Oli, and uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be uh, to be with you all, uh, and also to share uh, this uh, this panel with uh, with uh, friends and uh, people that are helping us so much uh, to prepare this finance in common summit. Yes, of course, uh, I will uh, I will maybe explain the role of public development banks, but. The name uh, we choose for the summit is is finance in common. So, meaning, uh, what could be the best uh, role, the best positioning for the public financial institutions with the other with the other actors, and to uh, to help, of course, um, finance uh, the response to the crisis uh, as well as uh, the transition. And so, um, thanks a lot uh, to, uh, to the organizers of this webinar to give us uh, the opportunity, to give me the opportunity uh, to put the summit uh, in, a, in a broader perspective and, and to, to see the big picture, to think big. Uh, and uh, I certainly count on uh, um, the exchange we will have today and the, the questions from the audience and, uh, and the good ideas uh, to um, unleash the full potential of uh, what uh, what we are what we are building uh, uh, together, uh, because this is the financial system as a whole uh, that we have to uh, uh, reorient. And it was the case before the crisis, of course, but uh, this urgency is only uh, reinforced uh, by it, with a special case, of course. Uh, for developing an uh, emerging economies, but but again, not developing an emerging economies by themselves, but uh, in uh, their relationship with the rest uh, of the world and the rest of the financial uh, system. Because of course we have this risk of uh, decoupling uh, uh, that uh, this tale of two cities uh, that Kristalina uh, Georgieva. Uh, uh, stressed uh, during the last uh, IMF and World Bank uh, annual meetings and the impact of uh, COVID-19 could be worse, of course, in uh, developing and emerging economies than in advanced economies, because these countries uh, face um, multifaceted crises, of course, uh, massive decline in commodity prices uh, stemming from uh, a simultaneous supply and demand shock, disruptions uh, in supply chains, uh, reduced exportations, um, and the need to implement uh, containment measures uh, domestically. And many of these countries, well, we all know that um, they do they do lack the they lack the fiscal space uh, to deploy uh, large fiscal packages. Um, to address uh, the current uh, economic shock. And of course, uh, because of this situation in the real world, uh, the impact on the financial system and on financial institutions uh, uh, can also be uh, severe. It will come from the damage to the real economy, of course, uh, increase uh, uh, delinquencies, bankruptcies, uh, sector-specific shocks, tourism, transport, as well as a potentially long global recession. And it will come from a, a financial shock. I mean, high volatility, uh, unexpected market moves, flight to quality, uh, all these events uh, uh, disturbing uh, uh, what uh, was progressively built uh, 
uh, in the global south uh, in terms of uh, sound uh, financial uh, markets. And of course, since uh, March, uh, we have already seen uh, um, very large uh, movements, uh, disturbing movements uh, from uh, investors, especially uh, having fled from, uh, from emerging uh, markets. And then when we, when we go at the level of uh, individual uh, financial institutions, the, the impact are multiple as well. Uh, massive asset quality deterioration, um, liquidity and solvency tensions, um, need to support your clients, clients uh, while managing your, your risk and uh, uh, easing treasury pressures. And uh, of course, for an institution like AFD, the fear of an eviction risk uh, from sustainable commitments uh, because of uh, because of the the urgency. So there was this nice move uh, on going uh, going green uh, and sustainable that uh, we uh, see uh, uh, endangered uh, by the situation. So that that's that's maybe. Uh, in broad lines, uh, the challenges uh, um, for uh, the financial system in developing an emerging economy. At the same time, uh, we all know that uh, part of uh, the answer uh, lies in the in the financial system and in, in its reaction to the crisis. Uh, of course, uh, we have to um, uh, do our best everywhere uh, to maintain liquidity uh, in uh, in the system and avoid avoid the chain uh, reactions of uh, bankruptcies and exclusion of vulnerable clients. Um, so this is the role, of course, of uh, central banks and and, and governments uh, with their fiscal uh, uh, capacity. Um, and we see a lot of uh, a lot of action on, on this side, including. Uh, I was with President Macky Sall of Senegal a few a few days ago, uh, including in, uh, in in countries in in Africa, uh, taking uh, strong measures to protect their their SMEs. Uh, we will have a specific uh, high-level event during the summit uh, to protect uh, African SMEs and, and join forces um, for 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 that. Uh, so that that's that's a key part of the equation, of course, uh, to uh, keep uh, companies and uh, and and populations uh, um, uh, above the line. I mean, uh, uh, alive. And then, uh, of course, at the same time, uh, the second uh, role of the financial system is to is to invest in in rebuilding a more resilient uh, uh, economy. Um, and um, this uh, uh, spur uh, of uh, investment of, uh, um, is uh, absolutely uh, essential um, and uh, uh, it has to go hand in hand uh, quantitatively and qualitatively. And, and that's the challenge right now when we see this, uh, uh, this $12 trillion uh, combined uh, a stimulus plan uh, worldwide. Uh, what are we doing with uh, these resources and are they consistent uh, with uh, long-term trajectories? Um, we are beginning to uh, design uh, following uh, the guidance of the, the Paris Agreement, uh, Article 2.1c. Um, uh, we, we decided five, uh, five years ago. Um, and so all this liquidity um, uh, around uh, at the time it has to land uh, into uh, concrete uh, investments, uh, project, and better uh, this lending uh, goes uh, uh, in the right direction than uh, on uh, the other usual, usual side. And good news is that it's clearly in a debate. Uh, I was, as I said, just I just closed the, before joining you the IDFC uh, annual meeting, uh, and we were uh, for three hours discussing um, SDG um, alignment and uh, uh, climate finance, of course, uh, which was at the heart of uh, what this club uh, is uh, providing, the, the largest provider of climate finance by far in the world. Huh? Uh, 
200 billion dollar a year um, and uh, it's fascinating to see uh, how all these institutions are thinking about are experiencing are developing uh, tools uh, are thinking on how to to help other uh, categories of uh, actors uh, to um, to align with Paris and now uh, that the social dimension uh, has come so strong in the debate uh, because of climate but because of uh, the crisis uh, as a whole uh, to align with um, with SDGs. So um, th this is where I'm, I come to uh, uh, the, the role of public development banks. Um, my understanding of the issue is that uh, uh, we missed, uh, we so dearly missed the public development banks for, for I don't know, maybe three decades. Uh, it's not saying that they are not there and that they are not uh, playing uh, their useful role uh, uh, everywhere. But um, um, of course, there's still um, there's still a bias or maybe a stigma uh, attached to these uh, to these uh, instruments. And and thanks to Stephanie, thanks to all uh, the other academics that uh, are helping us. Uh, building this uh, research conference called the Visible Hand that will take place uh, 9th and 10th uh, of, uh, of November and also in, in, a, in a week. Um, so Joe Stiglitz will be there in extern, uh, Mariana Mazzucato, uh, uh, you Stephanie Massoud Ahmed, the IMF uh, is producing a paper on this that's very significant. Uh, and, and hopefully uh, it will help um, challenge, of course, uh, public development banks, but also more clearly identify uh, what is their added value, what is their role um, in the financial system, uh, of course, uh, with, with, again, with the other actors. And um, uh, probably if we succeed in uh, correcting uh, these views and setting the right uh, policy, uh, recommendations uh, uh, to for these institutions to play their full and positive role, then uh, we'll come out of the Finance in Common Summit uh, a sense and, of community and uh, a coalition of uh, all uh, these institutions that could then uh, enter in a dialogue with the other uh, coalitions. And we know, of course, uh, what the governments are doing, uh, we know uh, what uh, NGFS now is providing on the on the central bank side. Uh, we know what uh, IIF uh, is uh, providing, and and probably for now the the, the, the field of uh, uh, public development banks was too fragmented for our group, uh, our community, to enter in a in a positive and at the right level. Uh, uh, discussion uh, with uh, with the other. Uh, when I say our group, you you know that uh, we will publish um, again the 9th of November uh, uh, a database uh, built with the uh, University of Peking. Uh, so ju just for for the audience, uh, we have uh, identified um, 452 public development banks, meaning. Uh, institutions owned by the government, uh, institutions that have a balance sheet, so that are financial institutions, and institutions that are following a, a development mandate, so not non-commercial, uh, with uh, investing uh, long-term, uh, embarking uh, sustainability issues. So these um, hundreds of institutions uh, amount to uh, nearly 12 trillion uh, combined balance sheet. And they are providing a 2.3 trillion dollar a year financing, and they're quite nicely balanced between the regions. There are, of course, a lot in about 150 in Asia and the Pacific. That's the largest region. 102 in Europe, 100 in America, and 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 95 in Africa, and. 
and of course their size is uh, different uh, but you have a strong basis uh, in each region on which uh, to expand because of course the figures uh, i was referring to are for 2018 they are the last known uh, uh, for all these institutions, uh, but uh, you can suspect that in 2020, uh, uh, alas, uh, these figures we, we would ha will have uh, drastically uh, expanded because of uh, the counter-cyclical role these institutions are playing. Uh, right now, uh, we see that uh, in each and every member of uh, the IDFC, we see that at the multilateral development banks level, uh, as well, including in poor countries. Uh, and probably uh, we can do more, of course, because the, sometimes the, the, the loan to ratio of these institutions is rather, the gearing of these institutions is rather uh, conservative. Uh, and so if pushed by our, by our shareholders, probably uh, we, we can do more. And at the same time, uh, again, uh, this is uh, one of the places uh, uh, in the financial system where we are feeling, we are like sensors of uh, these tensions between, uh, uh, between the goals, the various uh, sustainable uh, development goals and places where we are inventing uh, methodologies uh, to uh, uh, verify that uh, what uh, we are producing in terms of financing in co is consistent uh, with uh, uh, the international agenda in terms of um, in, in terms of uh, of quality. So so please uh, help us um, uh, make this uh, voice uh, of public banks emerge. It's not it's not it's not about public banks. It's not it's not for ourselves. It's just that um, I have the, the conviction that if this voice is not heard uh, in each and every financial system uh, at the right level, uh, intensity, with the right uh, bridging capacity between public and private, between short term and long term, between uh, international and uh, local, uh, between um, uh, liquidity uh, and projects, uh, probably uh, again there's something uh, there's something uh, uh, missing. So we will um, try to demonstrate this uh, from the 9th to the 12th uh, of uh, November. You you can register online. Uh, well, you you still have a, a few hours <laughs> probably to do that. So you're most welcome. And then. Have your views on uh, is it uh, is it convincing uh, enough, uh, and what's the echo of this uh, with uh, uh, the rest of the of the financial systems? And then, if convinced, if strong enough, probably um, there will be sequels uh, over time of this initiative. Uh, uh, probably we will enter in a more structured and and, and positive dialogue with the other stakeholders, uh, again, uh, central banks, uh, again, the society, uh, private finance, uh, uh, foundations, uh, trade unions. There are lots of uh, linkages uh, that have not been yet fully uh, explored. And hopefully, uh, at least, uh, so there will be a joint declaration of the whole community, uh, quite ambitious because, um, uh, uh, I feel uh, that there's a deep, deep consensus uh, in the group, uh, regardless of uh, our constituencies, of course, with differences, but these institutions, they have all heard loud and clear the 2015 uh, message, um, and uh, they try to demonstrate that it is possible. Uh, and the good news is that this message that started at the multilateral level, of course, uh, turned international, uh, regional, and now it has reached uh, national, uh, national uh, entities, uh, sub-national entities. Uh, I was yesterday on another webinar with uh, uh, my friend, the head of um, uh, la, the Bank of uh, Minas Gerais, uh, and, uh, and that I, was, I was so struck by what uh, he is experiencing in his bank on, on, on sustainable development uh, alignment. Uh, very innovative, uh, very, very powerful. And this is what you found uh, uh, with so many um, 
brilliant, fantastic CEOs uh, guiding their institution uh, in, a, in a very clear and collective, uh, collective way. Um, so maybe, Uli, I don't know, probably I exhausted my time. I can tell you about uh, AFD, what we are doing, but the best way is probably to turn to, uh, uh, to uh, Marianne, Shamshat, Sonny, Stephanie, under you, your guidance, and, and then come back if there are questions. Thank you very much, Remy, uh, for very thoughtful remarks. And I think it was very important that you highlighted that uh, it's not only the quantity of financing uh, that we need to see, and of course we, we need to scale up financing given the challenges uh, we face and not only uh, the, the challenges from the COVID crisis, but also uh, we, we must never forget that we are in the midst of a, a climate crisis that just by itself would, would uh, require us to massively scale up financing and adaptation and mitigation. But it's not only quantity, it's also quality that matters. And uh, I think, um, so you, you've highlighted that uh, development banks, VFIs are now also um, really trying to align their portfolios with the Paris Agreement. And, and uh, I mean, personally, I think this, you know, this could have been a little bit quicker, but I think uh, uh, this, is, this is now underway and, and this is really important. Um, and um, also, I think uh, the, the point about the counter cyclical role uh, of public development banks is, 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 is a point that can't be repeated often enough because um, uh, so often in development finance, when we talk about private capital, um, it, it tends to be in uh, there in abundance when, when you know, things are going well, but when things are not going well, uh, private capital uh, often tends to retreat and, and that uh, can often uh, make things even worse. Um, let me um, invite now uh, Shamshat. Um, so Shamshat, as I mentioned, is a chair of uh, the board of directors of Karandas Pakistan and also uh, has a wealth of experience in uh, development and also inclusive finance and uh, from former roles at uh, uh, the Central Bank in Pakistan, Finance Ministry, Vice President of World Bank and so on, uh, and um, uh, the Executive Director of the UNS Cup uh, in Bangkok. And uh, so I'm keen to hear your takes, you know, what are the, the pressing issues, you know, what are the main things to, to uh, uh, take care of now? Uh, Shamshat, the floor is yours. Thank you, Uli, and thanks to Remy for a very thoughtful presentation. Um, first of all, um, we have been discussing among the group a lot about the debt issues that confront um, globally. Um, I think the first and foremost thing is to recognize the size of the bill that uh, we have to foot when it comes to sustainable development goals. And uh, everybody knows that various estimates exist, but we're talking about five to seven trillion per year. And within that, for the low income countries, we are talking about two and a half trillion. Now the reason, and, and IMF has estimated that the emerging markets require 4% of GDP, while uh, low income countries uh, have an even more daunting bill uh, as high as 15% of GDP per year. Um, and one has to recognize that uh, only one third of it is being financed, uh, going to be financed and is being financed by the private sector. So clearly, uh, public sector has a role to play. Uh, public sectors at, of the national governments, public sector at the international level, the official development uh, role and the G20. So what is uh, the one major thing that needs to be done to jumpstart the sustainable financing at a time when the progress uh, in sustainable development goals um, uh, has not only been slow pre-COVID, but uh, there is a risk of it being stalled in at least the, the low income um, or even developing countries because of the preoccupation um, that we all have to have 
for the recovery uh, at this point with such sharp, steep economic contraction. So there was a hope if you actually look at the sustainable development goals and the sustainable financing architecture of the Addis Ababa, uh, that there was tremendous hope that um, uh, countries would be able to leap forward on their domestic resource mobilization. Um, and in the initial days when I was in the UN, we were thinking, okay, we need to have a target in the developing countries close to raising the tax GDP ratios or uh, all revenue GDP ratios to 22% um, of uh, the GDP. Now, that has been a dash not only pre-COVID because countries didn't lift their ambition on the domestic resource mobilization, the ones that needed to do, uh, but also because of the COVID-19, uh, there has been major distractions. So the fiscal uh, or the monetary modules of the country are totally focused uh, in a rescue mode for COVID. Um, uh, before I get into the actual description that I have, I'd like to take a moment to talk about uh, that the central banks of the emerging markets and developing countries, despite the fact that they have responded so decisively and effectively and have deployed a range of policies and tools to incentivize businesses and financial institutions to revive and stimulate economic activity, it has to be acknowledged that these policies are largely surrounding, of course, the liquidity support initiative, which is support for short-term funding. So SDGs need long-term funding. Counter-cyclical prudential measures through relaxation of the regulatory and supervisory requirements, uh, including capital buffers, is another area where work has gone in. Now, that's an area where, which could have been tapped for climate finance, um, as well as for SDG financing, but right now it's serving social safety net. Borrower assistance is another component which includes government-sponsored credit lines or liability guarantees to promote flow of credit to household and firms. So one wonders with so much of concentration on that side, how much will come for the sustainable development goals. And of course, monetary policy includes policy rate and quantitative easings, which has managed to support economic revival. The big concern I have is that this is the first phase of COVID, which has taken everything that was on cards in the uh, emerging markets and the developing countries. And this is not United States we are talking about, where the firepower uh, is much larger. These are very small numbers that we are talking about. Now, luckily, we do have financial stability of certain order, but sector vulnerabilities within the financial sector are a worry. Um, and I'm talking about the uh, analysis that I have looked at of the various countries' financial stability reports. Um, the uh, monetary policy easing clearly has also been unprecedented. It was unthinkable uh, that uh, emerging markets or central banks would go into uh, asset purchase programs, but they have gone in too. There are implications, uh, both medium term and long term, of this kind of monetary easing uh, within uh, the developing countries uh, because a lot of these developing countries uh, operate in a fiscal dominance environment where a lot of the funding goes to support the fiscal deficit rather than uh, exclusively sustainable development. So great idea to have a public sector institution uh, which uh, would bring sense hopefully uh, with the funding that it has gotten, it gets. Uh, but one has to think about how do you capitalize that institution at a time when resources are um, uh, quite constrained. Um, I would uh, go back to some of the debates we have been having uh, uh, with uh, uh, Uli being the driving force um, at the Sustainable Finance Center along with other 
uh, players. Uh, I think we have to look at a debt. G20 has to look at a debt uh, 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 release of a very different uh, qualitative nature and uh, uh, a sizable one. And uh, to possibly contemplate that uh, sustainable um, development goals uh, require sustainable recovery uh, and uh, sustainable financing. Um, so in the initial phase, uh, until the growth recovery emerges uh, to allow, to facilitate domestic resource mobilization, um, making sure uh, that um, you enhance the envelope of the debt relief, uh, participation of all the creditors, and uh, to make sure that the, the, um, uh, the amounts that are released, the fiscal space created by that is directed towards green recovery focused on um, uh, climate uh, adaptation and mitigation in a more focused manner because uh, we think that the sustainable development goals have been interrupted by pandemic. Wait, what? climate uh, adapt uh, uh, climate crisis would do so we are in a three dimensional crisis um, uh, pandemic uh, debt crisis as well as um, uh, a climate crisis uh, glaring uh, and is already happening in our footsteps now just to conclude i wanted to make another point that with all the, uh, the uh, the financial policies and uh, monetary policy easing that has happened, there has to be very careful reflection on financial stability, but also more on the medium and long-term effect of banking, capital markets, insurance, and asset management industry, because we are looking at financial sector in this dialogue. Uh, we're talking about uh, moving from the old uh, to uh, almost a new normal and enhancement of capital and regulatory frameworks following the 2008 global financial uh, crisis did leave the banks in good standing as we entered into COVID-19. But as we have entered into COVID-19, the debt crisis have totally, totally shattered uh, the countries. Um, and uh, also the, the banks are going to be on a weaker footing going forward because of the various um, schemes that have been loaded onto them, the emergency funding loans, the standby liquidity through loan facilities, the corporate and household indebtedness has been rising, and so and so forth, and lack of looking at the long-term institutional funding. So I'm going to stop here given that I was allocated five minutes, and I think I have taken five minutes, although Uli is smiling, so perhaps I think a bit longer, for which I apologize. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shamshat. Uh, as always, very, very deep insights, and um, thank you for, for framing the topic in, in this broader context and bringing in also uh, kind of fiscal monetary uh, policy and regulatory considerations, which uh, are of course very, very important here, and highlighting uh, the severity of the debt crisis, which which is really uh, one one of the looming threats above uh, all these policies. Um, I would li now like to to invite uh, Stephanie. Um, Remy already mentioned that uh, Stephanie has been uh, at the forefront of uh, working on. Uh, development finance and among many other topics she's also been uh, one of the, the major scholars working on uh, the role of uh, uh, public development banks and development finance institutions and uh, so uh, very keen to hear uh, your thoughts Stephanie. The floor um, is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to be participating in this panel and thank you very much Rudy, for inviting me and uh, so happy to be here with uh, the inspiring words of Remy and also the other fellow panelists. Um, so I want to start by focusing on the fact that we really need a very profound and radical transformation of the financial sector. 
to make it more fit for its main purpose, which is to serve the real economy and the society, both in good times and in bad times, in the short and in the long term. And I see uh, really two main roles. The first one, of course, is channeling savings where there are excessive savings to productive investment in a cost-effective way. Um, and this is, of course, particularly key in a moment when we have to make such a major structural transformation to a low carbon and inclusive economy, which of course will require major investment needs. And of course we knew that uh, the transition to the low carbon economy was going to have very large costs. But on top of that now, we have the fact that in developing and emerging economies, we've had this major setback because of COVID. And, and regions like Latin America and Africa, the UN actually estimates that about 15 years or 20 years of the major progress achieved in, for example, social sectors, in health, in education have been tragically reversed. So we have an additional major challenge. Um, and I think that uh, we have learned through crises and in normal times, that the private financial sector on its own will, will not do it, especially where there is uncertainty involved. And so that we need, as the conference that is being planned says, we need the role of the visible hand of government. Incidentally, Joe Stiglitz always likes to say that the reason why we don't see the invisible hand of the markets is that sometimes it's not there. But besides this major uh, structural transformation, we have to, as has already been referred by Shamshad and Uli, we need to provide a, counter, a financial sector that provides counter cyclical finance in difficult times, whether they are financial crises, other macro shocks, or now particularly the worst crisis of all in about 80 years, which is COVID. And, and so therefore, I think we need to help the financial sector. And we, do, we should do it on the basis of a sort of new paradigm. I would call it a mixed economy paradigm for development finance, going in some ways back to the period, the golden period after the Second World War, when public development banks played such a big role. Um, and I think that given the global, the so-called global financial crisis in 2008, 2009, and now with even more with COVID, we have a sort of renaissance, quite a sharp renaissance of development banks. As, as Remy so clearly said, at all levels, multilateral, regional, national, and even subnational, and also in all categories of countries, uh, developed, emerging economies, and low-income countries. And as was pointed out, actually Europe and Asia, and to a certain extent Latin America, are the largest areas. And I just want to stress uh, what Remy mentioned, that these are big actors, the total assets of public development banks in all these categories and regions amounts to almost $12 trillion. And the total annual lending is well over uh, $2 trillion. So in a, in a paper we did with uh, Regis Marodon from AFD and our friend Jose Antonio Campo, we estimated that if the lending by all these institutions increased by 20%, this year or next, it would amount to $400 billion. And if we consider that they can exercise leverage because they co-finance with the private sector and assuming rather conservatively that it is a leverage of only two, uh, we would have an additional $800 billion to both help the recovery from COVID and to start to, to deepen the structural transformation. But I think, I think we need more, and I think we need more ambition. Uh, because the task is so her Herculean, I think we need bigger public development banks. And 
And for example, I, uh, there's a lot of consensus, particularly in developing and emerging economies, that regional and multilateral development banks need a particular large increase in their capital, as happened uh, during the 2008-2009 crisis, when there was a superb response from the G20, and they increased very dramatically the capital of these banks, as well as issuing SDRs. Neither of these things have been done yet. And so I think it's very important that, that, the, that these development banks are increased in scale, but also that they're able to increase to the extent possible the leverage by better collaboration and smarter collaboration with the private sector. And listening to Shamshat, I, I also thought that there is a risk, of course, that some of the loans uh, that development banks have made, however prudently they're done in COVID times, may have a more of a difficulty uh, to be repaid. So that is again another reason, I think, to increase their capital and their reserves to have strong buffers because we are in these extraordinarily bad times. But also next to that, of course, and this, there's a lot of work going on in, in, in the research we're doing, in the dialogue with development banks, which will hopefully culminate in the summit and also in further work later, is how to improve the functioning of development banks, how to improve their governance, how, improve, how to improve the instruments they use, and how uh, to, to best uh, channel their, the coordination both with the private sector and with their governments to act uh, as an efficient bridge between public policy and private sector markets. And so the idea would be that thus strengthened, they could help very strongly the recovery during and after COVID. And it's very interesting that development banks, like for example, KFW, but many others, have applied an, a number of innovative measures during COVID. For example, they've applied debt standstills. They've adapted to give much more short-term lending because a lot of companies need working capital, need money to pay their workers. Uh, they have focused very rapidly on, in, on funding of health and funding value chains that have been disrupted by the pandemic. And they have also emphasized very rapid lending procedures for, especially for SMEs. And uh, for example, just to illustrate, KFW, which is the second largest commercial bank in Germany and one of the largest development banks, has increased its lending, according to IMF estimates, by at least 25% of GDP. So in a massive way, by doubling the, the operation in the first half of 2020. And this is similar throughout the universe of development banks. But there is the major challenge to combine, and this is difficult, as, as Remy pointed out thoughtfully, to combine uh, funding the recovery with continuing with the second big task, which is to build back better and to funnel, channel the funds to this uh, low carbon inclusive uh, development model. And I would just like to finish here by saying that one of the interesting things about development banks, which could in some ways perhaps be generalized also to the private sector, is that many, several of them have begun to use uh, interesting tools like shadow carbon pricing. For example, the European Investment Bank has been a pioneer of that, uh, whereby projects are evaluated not just on purely commercial terms, but they're also evaluated in terms of the impact on, on climate change. So, a lot of creativity, a lot of resources are needed to uh, help transform uh, development banks and the financial sector to serve the economy better in these difficult times. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Many thanks, Stephanie. Um, I, I found it very interesting how you also painted the, the longer, uh, uh, kind of uh, gave it a longer term perspective uh, and, and uh, uh, so it, it will be interesting to see whether whether we will see uh, this renaissance of of development banks, um, which, as you said, uh, played a very important role in many countries in in the uh, post Second World War era. 
um, and kind of over time uh, became quite unfashionable. Um, and I think, and, and you echo in a way also what Remy said before about not only quantity and quality, uh, not only uh, quantity, but also quality. So you've been calling for a big increase in capital of um, especially multilateral uh, development banks, regional development banks. Uh, but uh, I think the, the point that you couple this with a call also for improving the, the quality of governance and, and kind of the uh, approaches to lending and so on, I think that's very important because um, I think we, we, we should not get carried away with only praising uh, public development banks. And I mean, many of them have done a lot of great stuff, but um, there are of course also uh, valid criticisms and, and uh, including uh, the governance st structures and, and, and which also then have impact on the outcomes. Um, so I would now like to turn to uh, Marianne, um, who, as, as you know, is executive director of the Green Digital Finance Alliance. And um, so Marianne has, has uh, uh, over her career, worked a lot also on, on climate finance, financial inclusion, uh, but she's been at the forefront uh, of uh, uh, kind of the, the question of how can we use digital finance, which clearly is, uh, you know, the, I would say the absolute mega trend in, in financial markets now, how can this be employed in, in, a, in a better way um, to, to, to um, have sustainable outcomes? So kind of linking the digital agenda with the green sustainability agenda. Um, so I'm very, very pleased that we have Marianne with us now. And um, Marianne, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Uli, and thank you everyone for your excellent comments. I will, uh, as Uli said, uh, build on more of a digital perspective. Um, digital finance, of course, brings a bit new opportunities to rethink and redesign capital markets, but also retail financial instruments for, for green and for sustainability. Of course, it also brings with it new risks, and some of those risks we have been discussing in the context of the Libra coin but also higher indebtedness for fast credit, et cetera. I want to focus though my five minutes uh, on the question that Uli invited us to think about, which is to think big. And digital and digital finance invites us to think big in a different way. So it invites us to think big by aggregation of the many small, both at the investor side, aggregation of the investor, many small investors to make it up to trillions, but also aggregation at the asset level side. What we had seen in COVID and what we saw pre, uh, before COVID was um, a number of central bankers in developing countries looking to digital to think about how to not to lower their dependence on capital market finance. So we saw some years ago, um, the central governor of the the Central Bank of Kenya, Patrick and Uroge, issued the Makiba bond, which was a government security issued on a mobile platform. And his thinking was, well, let me as a, a central bank start to cultivate a greater culture of domestic savings. Because when I go to capital markets, the price is about 7%, which if you're the US, it's less than one. But if I can start to offer government securities efficiently at a low price to my citizens, then I can invite even those that are um, living in rural areas to also support the financing of government infrastructure. That was the first iteration of that we saw. Then we have seen uh, last year the issuance of a green retail sukuk, also on a mobile platform by Indonesia. Um, and what is interesting about the investors into that sukuk is that the largest percentage of it was actually millennial investors. Then during the COVID crisis, we saw the Philippine Treasury, together with the Union Bank of the Philippines, issue a citizen savings bond to respond to the COVID crisis. So this was actually issued on a distributed ledger technology so it was not even just on a simple 
mobile money, uh, mobile platform, it was actually on the most advanced types of digital protocols that we know today. And what that enables the Filipino Treasury to do together with the Union Bank was actually to offer citizens even that are unbanked because you don't need a bank account when it's on a DLT and a mobile uh, wallet on top of that to it, help the government uh, in, in finance the response to the COVID crisis without having to go to capital markets. So it increases the credit ratings and it changes entirely the accountability mechanism. So suddenly you're not accountable to a Chinese creditor, you're accountable for the financing of the response to your citizens. So that is the aggregation at the citizen level. Then to the aggregation at the asset level. As we, and as we heard about just before from Stephanie, the importance of getting financing to SMEs because of the fact that, uh, well, most jobs are created by SMEs, especially in developing markets. Um, what we are seeing now is, and what is really the potential is the aggregation of SMEs in a cost efficient way by leveraging mainly their transaction data. Um, what we have seen during the COVID crisis is the launch of the African continent's first ever digital uh, exchange, SME exchange, digital only by the mobile wallet EcoCash. Because what they realized is that we have a lot of liquidity sitting on their platform from local savings and how to channel that into growth SMEs in the country that are perceived as too high risk from foreign capital. And when we look to China, we can look to what can the future of this look like. On the MyBank platform, which is the largest SME lender in the country and one of the largest in the world, what they're starting to do is that they're starting to use their data points not only on the transactions, financial transactions of the SME, but they're broadening it out. So they're including green automated greenness rating into the automated credit scoring of the SMEs. So for instance, they're using natural language processing to automate to have machines read the utility bills of the SMEs and thereby automatically calculate an energy efficiency score for the SME and layer that into the loan so they can lower the cost of capital dependent on uh, green behaviors. This is what we can also move to other markets and where we could have development finance institutions play an extremely important role. Because a lot of the development finance institutions are, are investing or are shareholders in a number of the commercial banks on the African markets that, that have the SME credit lines or they're investing into the microfinance institutions that have the SME credit lines. We can start to look at how to further digitize those credit lines and also look at what are the data points that these banks, such as EcoBanks and others, already have that have carbon or other types of green capabilities. So we can start to put in greenness rating into these SME credit scores. So we can also bring lower cost of capital to green, um, to green SMEs on the African continent, uh, where currently the interest rates are around 16, 15%. So there is definitely room for uh, for starting to use data to innovate new types of digital SME uh, products for the African market. I will end up by thinking about what my call to action would be to the, uh, to the, to the development finance institutions. Development finance institutions, and I think my fellow panelists have also said, hold an extremely important role. And if we look at it through a digital lens, well, development finance institutions, if we look at the European ones, it's only 7% of the capital from the DFIs in Europe that go into agriculture and forestry. So really the, 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 some of the most important assets for the poorest people of the world. Um, but what is specific about development finance institutions, investments, instruments, is that the due diligence around it and the risk assessment is actually done really well because development finance institutions are ready to take the upfront cost of doing the due diligence. I think the next step for the development finance institutions to also grow a mandate and a public support to get more capital from taxes is to look at digital to open up a few of their investment vehicles to 
retail investment or to save us uh, in developing markets. Could take it could be a, a forest refinance vehicle, it could be a vehicle into small scale farming that could be opened up to citizens in the developed market to actually be part of and get closer to the assets because to today development finance institutions are a bit too far removed from the everyday lives of citizens. Most people don't understand what they're doing and they don't really know what their pension money uh, or their taxpayer money are doing in these, in these institutions. So using digital to start to engage also citizen level would be uh, one call to action. Another call to action would be uh, for the development finance institutions to lead the way to show how we can leverage new digital technologies to do biodiversity footprinting across portfolios. Today, we have the data capabilities. Uh, we have the Norwegian climate ministry that just financed open source satellite data from this year until 2023. So we can observe deforestation risks from the sky. We have bioacoustics that we can automatically capture below the canopy. What is the, uh, what is the biodiversity? before and after in an area of an infrastructure investment, we have the photo camera traps and we can layer all this in uh, efficiently and effectively with digital technology. But we need a development finance institutions to show how it's done and really set the bar high. I will stop here and look forward to the conversation. Thank you very, very much, Marianne. This was really fascinating and uh, so, you, you, you very nicely highlighted both the opportunities of providing uh, mobilizing domestic resources and, and thereby also reducing dependency on, on international capital, um, but also bringing uh, finance closer to citizens' needs. And uh, I think you're, uh, uh, you're pointing to uh, the, the huge potentials that uh, public development banks uh, have in, in, in using these technologies to, to uh, kind of update uh, their own softwares and, 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 and um, uh, really uh, building on what is possible um, in uh, leveraging development finance, I think is, is, is very well uh, made. Um, I would like now to uh, move to uh, Sony Kapoor, who uh, has been uh, one of the uh, leading voices in, in, in development finance uh, for uh, quite a while. He, he is now the uh, director of a new uh, think tank, the Nordic Institute for Finance, Technology and Sustainability, or NIFTIS. And um, Sonia, I'm very much looking forward to, to hear your thoughts. And um, I know you can think big, so please do. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'll try and uh, focus on what COVID has changed rather than, you know, uh, the nuts and bolts of, in, uh, of development finance. Uh, I think the first important thing to remember is, so since, as Remy mentioned, the two aspects that are most important is the quantity of finance and the quality, right? And we mentioned the big numbers lie in Western institutional investors of the order of trillions of dollars. And there's been about $11 trillion of quantitative easing. So one big problem faced by large institutional investors has always been income generation. How do they generate a return? Uh, and if you look at the past three or decades or so, two thirds of the, in, of the returns in Dutch, Norwegian and other pension funds have come from capital gains. And that's because of the secular decline in interest rates. That's been the biggest driver. And we've already hit zero. We've, we're sort of hitting negative. And even with additional QE, we have really reached the end of the road. So in our estimate, uh, future income returns, be it from dividends from shares or from, uh, you know, interest rates from bonds is going to offer returns of no more than two or three percent. And that is simply insufficient to meet our pension obligations. And at the end of the day, you can have finance dissociated from GDP growth, but eventually, you know, gravity reasserts itself. 
So there is a very strong link to future GDP growth potential and where financial income can come from. And in some sense, you know, COVID has accelerated what was already clear that the vast majority of future economic growth, GDP growth in the world, despite the setbacks that the emerging and the developing world is seeing now, will come from the developing world. I mean, it's just a matter of demographics and catch-up growth and how far they are from the technological frontier. And, you know, so that is, in some sense, a clear secular trend from which there is no escape. So if anybody is chasing returns, you know, profitability, which all of these institutional investors will have to, they will have to increasingly reallocate towards developing economies. The second interesting aspect of COVID is that it has actually shown the benefits of diversification. And as we know, economies across the world, uh, particularly in Asia uh, and in large tracts of Africa, have had very different COVID-related outcomes compared to, you know, let's say what's happening in Italy or the United States, et cetera, right? So there's been a significant diversity, both on what has happened in health, where, for example, Taiwan has had no cases for the past 200 days versus what's happening in the United Kingdom, but also on the economic impact uh, and I think the value of diversification away from institutional investors, which are largely concentrated in OECD economies, is going to become even more valuable. The third interesting thing that COVID has done is it has really turbocharged something that was already becoming a very strong secular trend, which is the need for reputation, call it either ESG or SDG related financing or the need to tackle climate change or sustainable or responsible financing. That really has been turbocharged with COVID where the, those so-called non-financial aspects have become ever more important in the eyes of citizens, in the eyes of regulators, and in the eyes of many of the large investors themselves. And I think all three of those, the need to generate income, the need to diversify, and the need to enhance reputation will potentially drive large institutional investors far more into the kinds of places where the SDG funding gaps are the biggest and the need for climate mitigation adaptation are the biggest, the funding gaps. The fourth aspect is, of course, it's important to remember that finance operates within regulatory constraints, right? I mean, so regulations effectively define the slope and the constraints and within that finance tries to maximize profitability. And I think that there is clear regulatory recognition and uh, everything from, you know, what will hopefully soon be mandatory climate stress tests to the UNDP OECD SDG alignment agenda what is voluntary now is likely to become compulsory and mandatory tomorrow. And the lie of the land is very, very clear that regulation will increasingly move towards driving finance in the direction that we want it to go. Uh, the fifth point that I think is very important is even at the same time as you know, COVID has stopped us flying into Sub-Saharan Africa to do due diligence, a number of the development finance institutions, development banks, et cetera, have had to adapt, right? And a number of the examples were used here. We've basically all gone virtual. So in some sense, the distance between me sitting in Oslo and what's happening in a small medium enterprise in Kenya has shrunk. And COVID has really turbocharged this digitization, the shrinking of distances, which is, which is one of the biggest constraints in financial intermediation. So I think the cost of financial intermediation across the Norwegian investment fund, the Norwegian oil fund investing in Kenya is going to shrink dramatically as a result of what has happened with COVID and the new ways of working, the new cultural adaptation and the new technological innovations that have been introduced. Uh, and I think last but not the least, so these are all, I think, the promising features for how COVID has potentially turbocharged the amount of money that is potentially available for SDG related and sustainability related financing. Uh, but at the same time, there is also a downside. So unless and until we change our methods, there is a real risk 
that the data points that are going to emerge from the crisis where, you know, because of what the Fed has done, because of the fact that OECD countries have had to yeah, have had, you know, 20% of GDP of counter cyclical response. We've come up with data points where emerging market currencies will have looked even more volatile where a number where the degree of counter cyclicality in policy space is much lower than what has been in OECD countries, etc. So if that is just normally treated as a normal data point, it can potentially show that the riskiness of emerging and developing economies is even higher than it was uh, as uh, in the past. And I think that is a real risk we need to address. Uh, but I think the advantages of what COVID will do long term to the field of development finance will far exceed the potential downsides. I'm done. Many thanks, Tony, for, for highlighting these trends. And I, I found particularly interesting your point about uh, kind of the, the development into kind of ESG sustainability related uh, areas. Uh, you know, being turbocharged now, but I wonder if, I mean, I, I would, I would like to add two caveats to that, and I wonder if you, if you agree. Uh, one is kind of the obvious question about greenwashing. Uh, so we have a lot of, um, uh, I don't want to name names, but uh, you know, the black rocks of the world, uh, who are talking a lot about, um, you know, all the great things they're doing. But uh, we also, I receive almost on a daily basis. Uh, reports from NGOs who show that, um, uh, uh, you know, this fund or this manager or uh, this bank has, has uh, uh, financed uh, whatever rainforest uh, uh, destruction and so on. Uh, I mean, that, that's one thing is, you know, are the, are the words really aligned with the action? That is really a big problem. There's a lot of liquidity uh, you know, waiting for good opportunities, everybody wants to go green, sustainable, and so on. But uh, if we look at poorer countries who need this capital the most, is this really going there? And this is, I think, the key question, because, um, uh, you know, kind of, uh, as we could see during the crisis, uh, even though they, they experienced uh, capital outflows uh, in, in March, uh, when, when kind of the global financial system was at the brink, but uh, capital returned relatively quickly to, you know, kind of the safer, largely emerging economies. But we do have, and that also is related to what Shamshad uh, uh, emphasized relating the debt problems. Uh, we do have now a growing number of, of uh, uh, low income countries that are increasingly cut off from international capital markets. And, and uh, the question is, will this reverse? Uh, now I'm, I'm kind of going into the discussion already. Um, and uh, so I, I must say, I haven't been a very good timekeeper, but one reason for, for, for this being the case was that um, all your interventions have been so interesting. So I thought like, no, let, let, let it go. Um, so uh, I would like to do a second round now. Um, so first of all, I'd like all, all panelists to, to join by video again. Um, and uh, starting in the same, go in the same order, starting with Remy, uh, invite you all to, you know, throw in your, your swords, you know, reactions, comments to what the others have said. Uh, and I would also like to, to invite uh, the audience to, to uh, um, uh, post questions in the Q&A function, if, if you have questions or comments, and I'll, I'll, I'll pick them up. Uh, I have much time left, but um, so let, let's do this. Um, uh, second round. Uh, Remy, please. Um, well, no comment on uh, what Stephanie said. I mean, we, <laughs> we well, she said uh, better than I what, and we're working so closely and then and, and no comment on, uh, well, we discuss, we are discussing often with Sunny or on the macro uh, on the macro scene and um, can only agree uh, uh, with what he said no i was very interested in uh, marianne uh, comment and uh, well being the shareholder as the ceo of afd of of proparco uh, 
one of uh, one of uh, one of the DFIs you were mentioning. There's a bit of a. Um, this is the reason why, with Stephanie, we are pushing for public development banks as a clear name, uh, encompassing concept to identify the 452 institutions I was mentioning. Sometimes uh, the the the, word, the acronym DFI is, uh, is is unclear. We don't know if we are talking about the whole group or only uh, about uh, the subgroup of public development banks that are devoted uh, to financing the private sector in the global south. And I think what Marianne was talking about was uh, the second exception of the term, which is for me the right one. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, they are um, very specific. Yes, uh, probably the European DFIs, uh, I know them for a long time, is, is an example of uh, cooperation between public banks that their mother entity or father entities uh, should uh, should pay a closer attention uh, when uh, liaising uh, with each other, uh, uh, not duplicating uh, um, diligence. Uh, well, and, and being way more way more rapid and uh, effective, uh, like they are, which does not mean that they cannot do better. And I was extremely interested in what you said uh, in, in opening up their instruments. Uh, and explaining our, our, our own citizens uh, what they're doing and that this is in their interest and that this is very concrete. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, and, and on this probably um, their shareholders are a bit advanced than them for a time, uh, push the ambition on sustainability. Uh, and you will see uh, by the summit uh, in November two elements uh, the European DFIs are preparing a statement that will be presented during the high-level event on uh, climate alignment, hosted, uh, sponsored by EIB. And so, so a common position uh, uh, that will go uh, really in the in the right direction. And the second high-level event is uh, the one uh, led by uh, HFI this time on. Um, SMEs in Africa. So all your proposal could feed in uh, uh, clearly this uh, both uh, discussions, uh, and I will convey them to uh, Gregory Clement, the CEO of uh, Proparco, immediately. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Well, I, I'm pleased that we already have some some direct action points resulting from from this event. That that's what we want to see. Uh, Shamshad, please. Thank you, Uli, for the second round, and uh, thanks to all the panelists for great um, thought-provoking interventions. <clears throat> I'll just talk about two uh, points. Uh, one is, I think Marion had great ideas, and I think we should take all that forward, and perhaps ask her to distribute her script, if she has, because there were so many things in there which are pertinent to the sustainable development intermediation also and also the digital finance world. Um, on the public sector banks, um, uh, which was not a topic I, I anticipated, but because I knew pretty little about uh, this, um, I have to share with you my own experience as a gov former governor of the central bank. I come from Pakistan and uh, we had public sector institutions and we still have a six development finance institution, which are joint ventures. Um, Pakistan's experience with public sector financial institutions has been very dismal, uh, uh, largely because of the issues that Stephanie pointed out, um, governance, um, uh, prerequisites that Stephanie pointed out, governance is very critical in a public sector institution, but also on what is the strategic frame of a public sector um, financing uh, body. Um, as, as governor, I try to also um, explore the possibility of establishing an infrastructure finance public sector institution. We had one in the past, which um, was doing a great job, and then it ended up um, in failure because of the governance issues. 
Um, and there, it, there was tremendous opposition simply because uh, everybody thought either you go for public-private partnership or you go for private sector infrastructure. So I'd be very curious um, uh, to learn more about how the lessons learned from uh, developing countries have been integrated in the, the futuristic proposal. I fully agree that um, SDG is a public sector agenda and we definitely need more uh, public institutions to push for it. But how do we go about it? Um, Marianne had great ideas, but also I'd like to read up more about um, the um, proposal uh, that's going to be at the summit. Thank you. Thank you, Shamshat. Stephanie, over to you. You're still muted. Thank you very much. Uh, it was such an inspiring set of presentations. But actually, one of the key points uh, that struck me when you were speaking, you were contrasting uh, uh, the liquidity, the excess liquidity we have uh, in the system with the needs. And you refer particularly to poor countries. But it's also true for middle income countries or even advanced countries that this big challenge of how you channel the available savings and liquidity to, um, to the needs. And I think one of the answers, um, you may not be surprised that I say this, is having appropriate channels, appropriate mechanisms. Because when the central banks just print a lot of money, a lot of it then ends up uh, in the private banks, the private banks put it back in the central bank. But what you want is for the money to go to the SMEs, to go to innovation, to go to green technologies. And you need mechanisms to challenge, uh, to channel this. And I think that uh, one of the actually secret strengths, if you like, of development bank is that they are a potentially good channel, provided they have good governance and so on. Uh, you could think of others, like Sony's in Norway, so you have the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, which channels a part of its savings to developing countries. Other sovereign wealth funds do the same. And one could also think in terms of the private sector, for example, you know, somewhat more directed lending uh, could be partly channeled to, to green activities, through, through regulatory encouragement, or, or, or through other ways. The development banks could encourage the private sector to go into particular sectors, innovation, and so on. So I think that uh, uh, it's somehow a, a gap in the thinking of economists who think about the macro issue and then separately think at a very kind of disaggregated micro level. And, and we're, we're not thinking about these intermediary institutions. Uh, and also we have to look back historically because I, I, I recently learned actually, I should have known that Roosevelt, one of the key mechanisms he used for the Green New Deal was uh, a major development bank, um, which was then bigger than Wall Street. So um, you you can you know you can learn from history, and we can learn, as, as Shamcha said, from each other. Um, I thought her point about Pakistan was important, but it's also I think interesting to see that, for example, India basically privatized all its development banks, but now they're thinking very seriously the conservative government of recreating one for infrastructure because they see that the private sector on its own cannot generate the long-term funding that is needed. So I think uh, we need to have a balance of having, yes, good institutions. And one encouraging thing in the research that we're doing is that there are countries that themselves in general don't have such good governance, but they have managed to in some way isolate the development banks and have these relatively well governed or other countries that have improved significantly the governance. One, one case classically quoted is the Uganda Development Bank, which major loss making and now uh, practically no losses, very good on complying with, with green standards and so on. And I think there was technical assistance, there was good leadership. So this is always, I, I think, a, a dynamic picture. Even the China Development Bank, the, the chapter on the China Development Bank in our book, 
the, the title says born bankrupt because the China development initially was, had made major losses. And then they got a very dynamic CEO and they were told they couldn't make any more losses and they don't. If anything, they're almost too commercially oriented, but at least they have recovered from this major, major loss. So I think we have to think uh, in a dynamic way. Thank you. Many thanks, Stephanie. So I notice we're, we're running out of time, so we have only five minutes left. So this, this de facto is now the, the closing round, um, which is a little bit unfortunate, but uh, let me hand over to, to Marianne. Well, thank you, uh, and thank you, uh, Remy, for for the for the very positive response and uh, and support. Uh, I think that is uh, that was the best outcome of this uh, conversation we could I could have wished for. Uh, and happy to share any of our work and thinking uh, with, uh, of course, all of you, and and to take these reflections forward, hopefully into more market demonstration, also, uh, so we can uh, we can or experimentation to scale uh, some of these uh, use cases out there. I wanted to pick up on the on Sony Kapoor's uh, really interesting uh, comment around sort of ESG and, and reputation, uh, sort of basically your behavior being your new currency in a way um, as an asset if you want to attract the investors, because that was actually, we had the first uh, ever um, digital bond issuance on a, on a DLT platform by the World Bank. It was the I, the I bond, a sustainability linked bond with CBA in 2018. And that was exactly the response of that digitization of the bond issuance process was that the investors felt much more close to the asset. Uh, it was much more frictionless uh, and therefore the trust uh, and the perceived risk went down. So how can we think about and use some of deploy some of the digital tools and some of these lessons to also bring down some of the perceived risks that has resulted in what you talked about, Uli, of the capital flight uh, out of these countries due to COVID-19? How can we use these digital technologies through data? Because what we're seeing in a lot of these uh, fintech solutions is uncollateralized lending or data being the collateral. Uh, how can we use uh, data to, um, to de-risk, both at a perception level, but also at an, a real asset level, uh, these investments so we don't see the same uh, capital flight out of these countries uh, from green assets uh, when we have future shocks. Uh, I'll stop it there and just look forward to the conversation going forward. Thank you, Marianne. I think you've, you've really uh, brought very important points to, to this discussion because I think the digital really has to be um, has to be given much more prominence also in the development financing world. Um, Sony, actually, can I invite you to 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 uh, uh, I'll say one sentence afterwards? But... Sure, I. I lost you for a second, but I think you're done. Uh, well, uh, on your first point of greenwashing, uh, the fact that everybody feels obliged to greenwash is actually a huge progress, right? I mean, for the most part, up until now, you know, Exxon was happy being Exxon and, you know, everybody else was happy being a pure oil and gas firm and, you know, BlackRock didn't care about even bothering to greenwash. And everybody is, knows and understands that the public mood has changed, that the zeitgeist has changed, that the reality of climate change and the physical impacts are being lived across the world by more and more people, that this is an issue they can no longer ignore. So this is a step in the right direction. You know, a lot of the the greenwashing will fall away, things will become more rigorous, people will face reputational risk, but, but we are headed in the right direction. The fact that everybody feels obliged to either greenwash or actually do something in reality. Uh, on your other point, and also the point that I think Stephanie and a lot of the others brought about, which was there was a big difference between you know, sort of liquidity being available, central bank liquidity being available, and it actually being deployed. And this is where you know, I put the whole burden of responsibility on Remy. So much depends on the outcomes 
of the Finance and Commons Summit. Because effectively, if you think about this, you know, this is water at two levels. So up here in the tank is this huge pool of liquidity, which has been enhanced by the central banks. And down there are the where economic returns are actually available, which is where the demographics are changing, the number of consumers is rising, where you know, even basic technology like a simple mobile phone can triple someone's productivity, right? I mean, the economic logic of where economic growth is going to come from is indisputable. The long-term link between economic growth and financial returns is also indisputable. The question is that we have been terrible at connecting these two, the pipe work, the uh, intermediation infrastructure that connects the Norwegian oil fund to the SME in Kenya has been terrible so far. And if Remy is successfully able to herd cats and bring together you know, uh, the African development banks, many of whom are sub $1 billion, with the giants such as the China Development Bank and the World Bank, et cetera, many of the Sub-Saharan African development banks are totally undercapitalized. The World Bank uh, and the African Development Bank and the other MDBs between them have $1.3 trillion of additional lending capacity without losing you know, a, a AAA or a AA minus rating, right? Uh, so there is a sensible way of using this existing pipeline of infrastructure to get these uh, development banks to work together coherently to be able to channel that money. And if we are able to do that, with the reality that there is actually much more demand to be able to do this together with what Marian was talking about, the enabling impact of technology, which significantly reduces the potential and the, and the cost of, of this intermediation, then I think we are ready to actually finance the decade of action. So Remy, it's all up to you. So there's a little bit of pressure on, on Remy. So we, we clearly uh, count on uh, what, what came out very nicely is that uh, there certainly is a very important role for public policy to bridge the gap between finance and the real economy. So uh, we, we've seen a lot of activity in finance, but not everything has been really contributing to, to real progress down on the ground. And it would be naive to, to believe that uh, public development banks will, will be the panacea and that they will uh, be alone uh, doing the trick, even though, of course, we count on you, Remy. But um, I think it's also clear we all in this discussion uh, uh, have agreed that there is an important role, and, and, uh, but we also do need new ways of thinking. So, you know, just doing the same trick all over again uh, will not do. And I think, in particular, uh, the points Marianne made about the, the potential of, of digital um, uh, very much so, uh, you know, the, the potential to use um, kind of bottom-up approaches, because that, that is one of the beauties, in my view, of, of uh, some of these new digital technologies. Um, but for this to really take off and, and, and uh, get scale, uh, we do need players such as uh, development banks. So um, we are over time already. Uh, I would like to thank you very, very much. It's had, it has been a fascinating discussion, I think. Um, I wish we had another half hour or another two hours uh, because there are still a lot of uh, issues on the table, but um, time is up. So uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, this video will be uploaded uh, and uh, I hope uh, uh, many will have the opportunity to, to watch it later on. Thank you very much. And um, uh, Remy, uh, we count on you. Have a great uh, summit. Stephanie and others will be helping you. With your help. Thank you, Uli. Um, Thanks for the opportunity. Thank well, uh, thank some you, of the everyone. ideas discussed will be taken forward. Merci beaucoup. Au revoir. And stay Thanks. safe. Bye.